Good afternoon. My name is Victoria Yu, Chair of the LBJ Library Future Forum Board. On behalf of the Future Forum, thank you all for joining us today. On June 24th, the Supreme Court voted to strike down the landmark Roe v. Wade decision, determining that the constitutional right to abortion does not exist. The decision was met with a variety of responses, celebration and excitement among pro-life advocates, and shock and deep disappointment among those who believe in a woman's right to choose. Today's conversation is intended to discuss the implications for Texans, not only health, but also social and economic consequences. The Future Forum brings together individuals with different backgrounds, experiences, and points of view to discuss local, statewide, national, and global topics that affect us today. Our goal is to create civil, informed, and bipartisan discussions. Today, we're honored to be joined by three experts, Dr. Abigail Aiken of the LBJ School of Public Affairs, Dr. Myra Panetta Torres of the Georgia Institute of Technology, and Dr. Carrie White of the Steve Hicks School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Austin. There will be an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the conversation. You are able to type questions into the Q&A box throughout today's event, and we will address as many as we can at the end. And now, I'll turn it over to our fantastic moderator, Corinna Klein host of Capital Tonight on Spectrum News to lead our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, and, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm very interested in hearing what all of these uh, panelists have to say as well, an issue that we've been covering a lot on the show and uh, diving into in, in all aspects. And Texans are really having to navigate a new reality since the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And so all of these panelists are here to kind of help us understand who's most affected, what's next for women and how doctors are having to navigate this new re reality and how they're responding. And I'm just gonna run through how qualified all of these people are to be talking about this. Uh, joining us today, they mentioned Abigail Aiken. She's an associate professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Her research focuses on unintended pregnancy, evidence-based obstetric practice, and the impacts of laws and policies restricting access to abortion. She frequently testifies on reproductive health issues and provided expert testimony to the Irish Parliament on the 2018 abortion referendum. She has consulted for the CDC, the World Health Organization, and the UN. Myra Panetta Torres is an assistant professor in the School of Economics at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Her research interests lie at the intersection of health and economics, or health economics, excuse me, labor economics and gender economics. Her current work studies the health and economic impacts of access to reproductive health care. And Carrie White is an associate professor in the Steve Hicks School of Social Work and a faculty research associate at the Population Research Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research focuses on evaluating the interrelationship between people's reproductive health behaviors and outcomes and the health services and policies that shape their access to care. So again, welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us. And Carrie, I'll, I'll start with you. I mean, the overturning of Roe, of course, comes after Texas had already put in place a, a near ban on abortion with the so-called Heartbeat Act, which restricts abortions at about six weeks of pregnancy, which is before many women even know that they're pregnant. Um, what lessons have we learned after a poster of Texas over the last 10 months that SB8 has already been in effect? Well, one of the things that we've learned from our research that my colleagues and I have done at the Texas Policy Evaluation Project is that these kinds of restrictions certainly do nothing to end people's need for abortion care or people's desire to seek abortion care. Um, it does not change people's experiences of having unintended pregnancies. Um, what we have seen is that um, over the last 10 and a half months that the numbers of abortions provided in Texas have decreased significantly, but we have also seen that more than a thousand Texans are traveling out of state every month to obtain abortions at facilities in other states. Um, many were going to Oklahoma before that state banned most abortions in April of 2022. Many were also traveling to New Mexico, Louisiana, Kansas, Colorado, even Mississippi, in order to be able to obtain an abortion. And this was coming at an incredible sacrifice. People were delaying paying their bills, um, not buying groceries for their families, 
driving through the middle of the night long distances so they could try to minimize the amount of time that they took off from work or needing to have someone take care of their children, bringing their entire families with them because they didn't have anybody um, to help with those caregiving responsibilities. So this has really made it very difficult, even though we've seen large numbers of people traveling to get care in other places, um, it is coming at great sacrifice. Okay, I'll, I'll let you weigh in on what Carrie was saying, but also just even furthering that. I mean, how will the new laws or, or will the new laws in Texas um, post row have, I mean, kind of what will the impact be expected on, on those who really supported them? And what can we learn from what we've seen in other countries? I, I know an expertise of yours and what you've looked at. Thank you, um, Karina. I think to add to what Carrie is saying, certainly because there has been no change in people's need to access abortion services, in addition to traveling out of state, we will see more people self-managing their abortions. And what I mean by that is performing an abortion or conducting an abortion outside of the formal healthcare setting. And that can mean a lot of different things. Um, it can mean self-sourcing abortion medications or abortion pills and using those at home. There's a variety of ways people can do that uh, online um, or by crossing the border if they're able to do that to pharmacies in Mexico. It could mean herbal abortion. It could mean um, ingesting substances that might be unsafe. It could mean physical harm. It can mean a whole spectrum of things. Increasingly, we're seeing it mean abortion pills. Um, and we do have evidence for the safety and effectiveness um, of doing a medication abortion yourself at home. But one thing that we found in our research, um, I lead the Project SANA team here at UT Austin, we're looking at self-managed abortion in Texas and the US. We saw with Senate Bill 8 that a policy shock like that, when you really restrict care um, by a gestational limit, for example, you see increases in people looking online to self-manage uh, abortions with pills. And we expect fully to see that increase um, even further now and in a very sustained way uh, following the new laws in Texas, which right now I think are pretty murky in terms of what is exactly in effect and who it applies to. But certainly the trigger ban is coming um, very soon. And I think we will be looking at those numbers uh, to see what we see, but certainly expecting, looking to other settings, we can talk about Ireland as a really recent example of somewhere where there was a complete uh, outlawing of abortion since the 1980s that only changed in 2018. And our work there tells us that even in the face of laws that explicitly criminalize self-management for the person who is self-managing, at least five Irish women a day would go online and source medication abortion pills and do their medication abortions at home. So we actually don't have to look too far uh, to see that, um, you know, again, the need for abortion hasn't changed and people will very often find ways um, of taking care of their needs, whether that be traveling out of state if it's possible for them or doing their own abortion at home. I know you mentioned just kind of what we're seeing in terms of um, people traveling, and I know Carrie spoke to this as well, but uh, Myra, I'll bring you in here too. Um, with so many women already seeking abortions in states where it's legal, I mean, what is happening with Texans? What are you seeing in terms of them trying to obtain abortions outside of the state? Well, I, I, I would say uh, what I know is mainly based on some of the research, including a uh, CARI's research out there, which is documenting what women are doing right now as a response to these policies, particularly because we don't know the end of the story in terms of what are going to be all the unintended consequences of such policies, but we know some of the immediate effects, right? And these are some of these effects that CARI mentioned, which includes people, uh, as you said, they are traveling out of a state. But who are the people that are traveling out of the state? In some way are those that can afford it. And I am not saying these are higher, uh, high income women, are those women that are not in the lower tail of income for which all these additional costs are so big that prevent them from getting access to abortion. So here we are talking about one specific population that can travel to other states. But what happened to those that cannot travel to other states? And these are the women in which we are going to see lots of the unintended consequences that we have learned from research that come from facing an unintended pregnancy, carrying that pregnancy to term, 
and then seeing all these snowball of effects which reflect on a household that may live in poverty, a household that may rely on public assistance, women, these women or these people who couldn't uh, access to abortion services and interrupt the unwanted pregnancy, they may uh, face in general a change in their life trajectory in terms of abandoning their education, altering their investments in labor force, affecting uh, also the next generation, which I would say this is something that we cannot see yet because this is very recent, but these are facts that we have learned from research that has focused from other moments in the history of abortion access in the US and that has been already documented. Yeah, I want to get into that a little bit more with all of you, but um, first, Carrie, I, I know that we're even seeing some of the fight in the pre row laws here in Texas and kind of what's legal and the, the legal fight that we're seeing with um, who can still access and what kind of penalties are in place given those pre row laws. I don't know if you can speak to that, but also just under what circumstances can abortions be provided in Texas once the state's trigger law does go into effect? Yeah, so the, the law that was originally challenged in Roe v. Wade was a Texas law that um, criminalized physicians for providing abortion, and it also included penalties for people who, you know, helped someone procure an abortion or the means um, for an abortion. In, you know, kind of current times, that could be someone who um, provides and pills to someone um, who ultimately has an abortion or self-manages their abortion. Um, what the courts have at least currently decided is that um, some elements of that pre-row ban um, are in effect and people could be charged under those criminal provisions. But once Texas's um, trigger ban goes into effect, which as Dr. Aiken mentioned, should happen in the next couple of weeks, um, this would impose far steeper criminal penalties on people who violate the law. So this can be fines of at least $100,000, and people will face you know, two to five years in jail or even uh, in prison or even longer, depending on um, their involvement um, in the abortion procedure and what specific laws are being used to charge them in that case. And um, to your question about you know, what medical care can be provided right now, um, both the, the laws that Texas currently has in place, for example, um, Senate Bill 8, which has been in effect for the last um, 10 months or so, as well as the trigger ban, once that goes into effect, do allow exemptions for medical emergencies. The law does not allow for abortions to be provided in cases of rape or incest, does not allow abortions to be provided in cases in which there is a severe or life-limiting fetal anomaly, and what we have heard in some of our research interviewing physicians and patients who have experienced complications during their pregnancy is that this medical emergency exemption is far too narrow and really doesn't allow physicians to provide the standard of care for people who are experiencing complications in their pregnancy. They are really having to wait until someone is, in the words of someone that we spoke to, on death's door, admitted to the intensive care unit, who has developed a life-threatening infection who is hemorrhaging and is at risk of dying before they are able to provide care. This is not how we treat medical problems in other areas of medicine. And really providers are being prevented from intervening early on before very serious complications can develop. Abigail, I'll bring you in here because um, I know you've been looking at this as well. I mean, not only just how this will affect other aspects uh, of medical care and the, the doctor-patient relationship between a, a pregnant women, but kind of what we're already seeing um, and what you're seeing. Yes, it's an incredibly complicated situation right now, as Dr. White has, I think, very clearly explained. And it's also very chilling. You know, there are um, uncertainties here for people who would self-manage their abortions, for people who would provide care, for people who want to help others. Um, you know, even with Senate Bill 8 still on the books, we are not entirely sure uh, 
how effective that law might be in terms of civil action against people. Remember, Senate Bill 8 is a civil action, not a criminal action law, uh, but there have been uh, cases, but we have not seen resolutions yet. So I think we're in a very unclear place when it comes to um, how much people can help, uh, what the penalties might look like. Um, of course, for the people who are self-managing their abortions, that is something where, like I said before, we have really good evidence from our own research uh, within our project team that if you're doing that with pills from an online service like the aid access service people out there might have heard about, there are uh, very good rates of effectiveness and safety for that kind of a service, but that does not completely negate legal risks. Now, Texas does not uh, at present have any state law that would explicitly criminalize a person that self-manages their own abortion, i.e. does their own abortion at home, outside the formal healthcare setting. There are very few states, uh, even in our new post-row situation, that do have a law on the books that would explicitly criminalize a person who self-manages, but that doesn't mean there has not been surveillance and there hasn't been legal harassment and there hasn't been what I would call unjust prosecution of people when um, prosecutors decide to throw legal spaghetti at the wall and try to figure out under what statute can I take uh, criminal action against you. And we have seen uh, if, when, how, lawyering for reproductive justice, a legal team based out of uh, Berkeley, California, have been tracking these kinds of cases. And there have been at least 24 cases over the past two decades of people being um, brought into legal jeopardy or be prosecuted for alleged self-managed abortion. Uh, a lot of the times those cases don't end up going ahead, but the person is still, still subject to a very stressful uh, and very um, you know, difficult process. We had a case in Star County, Texas, uh, a couple of months ago where somebody was unjustly uh, illegally harassed. And fortunately, the district attorney said, there's no crime committed here. We are not going to take this forward. But that is very zip code dependent, you know, depending on where you are in a state, depending on where you are in the country, what that legal picture looks like is going to look different. Um, so I think we can expect to see more more of this as we see more people um, self-managing their abortions at home. Um, it's not clear whether states will uh, have an appetite for passing future legislation that would explicitly criminalize self-managed abortion, but I think it's very clear, uh, again, I'll go back to Ireland and say, even in the face of a very clear criminal law against self-managing, people still did it. And the consequences were generally that they were very isolated from the formal healthcare setting. If someone does a self-managed abortion at home and feels that they want to have follow-up to check everything went okay, or they really want someone to talk to, or they want some information about the process, or they are in the rare situation of experiencing a complication where they do need medical attention, we cannot underestimate the chilling effect of not being not feeling secure, not feeling able to access that care uh, when it's needed for fear of uh, being interrogated by a medical provider. There is, to be clear, no duty of a medical provider in Texas right now to ask someone, did you self-manage an abortion? There's no duty to report that to anybody, uh, but a provider might think that there is, they might be worried about that, they may be unclear about the law, um, or they may personally have feelings about that that make them feel, I'm gonna report this. That's often, unfortunately, how people get into uh, legal jeopardy. So I think uh, clarity around that is really important. And I think that unfortunately, even when laws don't uh, have those specific provisions for criminalizing self-managed abortion, you do have this chilling effect where people feel very isolated uh, from the formal healthcare setting and the doctor-patient relationship really can't function because it's a relationship that is based on trust. And if you can't talk freely with a doctor about what's happening, it makes that providing the best standard of care really very difficult. And can I just jump in here and say that I think that this um, complication in the doctor-patient relationship is something that we are also seeing um, here in Texas, where providers are afraid because of these civil and potential criminal penalties, they are afraid to refer patients to other states to get medically necessary care. And patients feel really isolated. They feel abandoned and they feel completely overwhelmed trying to figure out where they can go to get care so that, you know, the pregnancy that they wanted, that that baby no longer suffers, so that their health is no longer at risk. And they are just feeling left to their own devices to figure that out. And it is a real um, disservice to people needing medical care. 
Myra, given that, and I know a lot of what you're looking into is access and the economic effects of this. I mean, explain to us kind of what the costs are for a woman trying to travel out of state to get an abortion and give us some context behind that. There are two costs, and Dr. White, she actually already mentioned some of them. We have theoretically documented them, but there are actually SORPI papers that show this. So when a woman is looking for an abortion or a person who needs an abortion looks for this service, it is not the case that she or they are only paying for the service. There are so many arrangements or so many things go, happening around that decision that she or they have to take into account. So for example, uh, if she has to take time out of job, then she has, and she's, a, this is a salaried work or she's paid by the hour. This is money that she's going to lose, no matter what. Then if on top of that, she requires, she already has a family, she requires the daycare and she doesn't count with a network of people that can support her to take care of the existing children, then this is an additional cost. So these are things that she has to consider besides the cost of the procedure. On top of that, we know that right now, and even before uh, Roe being overturned, there was a scarcity of abortion facilities. So any person looking for an abortion, it was very likely that she or they would have to, to drive very far away to find the provider. So that means that it is lots of time used traveling to the provider, which involves paying for gas. So th these are the direct costs. At the moment, the person is looking for the abortion. So there are here two paths. Either the person can get the abortion or not. If the person gets the abortion, we usually document, okay, the, then the unintended pregnancy uh, was uh, interrupted. So therefore, potentially there was not a change in the economic pathway of this person's life in terms of educational attainment, in terms of labor force participation, uh, in terms of the future generation, etc. But what happens for these people that are unable to interrupt the unwanted pregnancy? And this is where uh, we have been documenting this health and economic impacts of being unable to interrupt a pregnancy or being unable to access abortion services. So we have some evidence, as I initially mentioned before, which comes, we have most of our evidence in terms of economic impacts coming from the abortion legalization. From the 70s, in which we had some states that were the repeal states that legalized abortion before other states, and comparing outcomes for women that were living in states in which abortion was still illegal versus those states in which abortion was legal. There, we learned that when women gain access to abortion in those repeal states, there were benefits in terms of educational attainment for women exposed to that policy. There were improvements in access to the labor force, in pa participating in the labor force. There were improvements for the next generation. Those children born to women that were exposed to the legalization of abortion were less likely to live in poverty, less likely to grow up in a household that, that relied on public assistance. And interestingly, once in a different study, once these people are tracked later in life or they, these generations that were exposed, whose mothers were exposed uh, to abortion legalization, also as adults, the next generation, they were less likely to rely on public, assi public assistance and uh, live in poverty. So that's from what we know from the 70s. But going back to once uh, people are unable to access abortion services, we also have very compelling evidence on what has happened to those people. Uh, Dr. Diana Green Foster, uh, she has uh, been, been conducting a study, or well, she conducted a study. The name of this study is the Turnaway Study. And what they did is that they tracked women who were denied an abortion because they were right above the gestational limit in the state. And there have been different studies based on this. One of them uh, studies the economic consequences of being denied an abortion. And what they do is that they compare different economic outcomes, which I will explain which outcomes are those uh, next, of those women who were denied an abortion because they were right above the gestational limit with those of women who were right below the gestational limit, which means they could access abortion services. And what they observe is that women who were denied the abortion were more likely to live in poverty, to face unemployment, to face delinquent debt, to face bankruptcy, 
up to four years after being denied the abortion relative to women who were not denied the abortion. We also know, for example, that when women uh, during adolescence have, uh, were exposed to parental involvement laws, which is another type of abortion restrictions, uh, their educational attainment was lower relative to women living in states that uh, didn't implement parental involvement laws. We also know that, for example, regulations on abortion providers which is what HB2 in Texas was, these policies uh, that require abortion providers to comply with very specific requirements. We know that those policies, their impacts not only are reflected on increases in unintended births, also for women who were exposed to these policies during their adolescence, it translates on lower probability of initiating college or completing college. And this is something like, I will just briefly mention it because I think we will talk about that later. There are disparities across demographic groups. All these findings I am mentioning here, they are not homogeneous across all people. There are disparities across demographic groups and this has been well docu documented in the literature. Yeah, and I do want to get into kind of the the people this is most affect who are most affected by this. But um, Abigail, I'll, I'll ask you this because I know that the abortion funds were mentioned too. But seeing a lot uh, of what were how those have helped people who are traveling across state lines to try and get an abortion where it is legal, kind of what could be affected as Republicans in certain states like Texas uh, try to now pass laws so that you can't go across state lines. Um, in order to obtain an abortion, but also just the effect that some of these abortion funds have had um, for people getting them and, and what we could see if, if those are restricted. Yeah, I think uh, probably Dr. White will have a comment on this too, but uh, what I can say is that of course, uh, for sure, abortion funds have for decades been playing a really critical role in helping people in Texas to access abortion care. Uh, because even before we got to our current post row situation, um, as Dr. Pineda Torres pointed out, these laws that we've had on the books now for, for a decade uh, really don't affect people equally. When you do things like uh, force clinics to close because they can't comply with requirements that are not necessary, and so you reduce the number of clinics in the state, you increase travel distances, you increase the cost of abortion care by stopping health insurance plans from covering it, by stopping state Medicaid funds from being used uh, to cover it by requiring people to attend multiple appointments when it's absolutely medically unnecessary to do that or to have an ultrasound and pay for that and pay for the provider time when that is not at all medically necessary, you increase the cost of care. And so people living in poverty, uh, people who are on the margins of poverty, people who are you know, actually not in poverty, but also not super well off are going to have real problems uh, trying to afford this care. And as you make all of those things worse. So you then require people to travel out of state. Um, you know, the costs keep increasing, the time off work keeps increasing, the need to find childcare keeps increasing. And so we've seen abortion funds play this critical role in helping people to meet those costs uh, for at least the last decade, if not longer at this point. And that is now intensifying, right? The role of these organizations is in some ways even more important than ever, but the work that they do has been hampered uh, by state laws that seek uh, to uh, either civilly or criminally punish people who would quote unquote aid and abet uh, someone seeking abortion care. Those laws are incredibly chilling because there's so much uncertainty around how they will play out legally. We don't actually know yet. Um, and I think it's a big risk to people who work in abortion funds to take that on. You know, it's unacceptable to say you need to figure out whether you're going to face criminal prosecution or not. Um, and I think that uh, in the absence of that kind of support, whether it's transport or funding uh, or something else for people, um, you know, we are going to see more people unable to make those journeys, unable to meet those costs. And that will play in again uh, to how people access care, whether they remain pregnant uh, when they don't want to be or whether they self-manage. Uh, those options are getting, uh, the sort of range of options is getting smaller for people as abortion funds are hampered uh, in their really critical work. Um, Dr. White, I, I'll invite you in also because you may also have things to say. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Aiken. I think I would just add to that that um, while abortion funds have been around for um, decades in Texas and, and other states, 
you know, during the the 10 months or so that Senate Bill 8 has been in effect, they have really provided a financial lifeline to people who are needing care. Those who were eligible for abortions in Texas still under the very narrow gestational age limit that SB8 allowed, but especially for people who were traveling out of state. They were helping to cover the cost of gas, food, people who got stuck in a snowstorm traveling to another state and needed to stay in a hotel unexpectedly and had no clothes um, that they could wear the next day. Um, They were really essential in in providing that kind of practical support um, as well as um, helping people get to a facility and paying for the cost of the abortion um, and multiple visits if needed. And this for the many people who were living on low incomes Um, was just an incredible lifeline to help offset the other economic challenges. Maybe they only had to delay, you know, one of their bills versus multiple um, in order to be able to get to care. And with the kind of legal crackdown or threats for legal action that are being um, placed on abortion funds and, and those who Um, partner with them, um, it really may cut off the ability for people to get services in other states. And I think the final point that I would just add here, something to keep in mind, these are really grassroots organizations. They're smallly staffed and rely a lot on volunteers. And so this is really the threat of criminal and civil action against you know, people who are volunteering for an organization is just something that we really need to keep in mind about, you know, how these laws are impacting people who are supporting those who are trying to get services in another place. Dr. Wright, I'll just add to and ask you this question. I mean, have you seen um, fewer dollars going to these abortion funds because of the potential chance of litigation and what we're seeing uh, of the risks, just in terms of people actually donating while they're trying to take care of, say, Colorado, trying to take care of their patients, but also dealing with all the Texans now coming in too. Is there even enough money there? Yeah, I can't speak to anything about the flow of donations, but I think something that has been on a lot of people's minds is that when Senate Bill 8 went into effect in September of 2021, there was such a huge influx of philanthropic support, small donors, large donors who were supporting both Texas and national abortion funds who were helping people get to um, abortion facilities in other states. The big concern that we have now is with so many other states Um, prohibiting abortion, Mississippi, Alabama, soon Tennessee, Oklahoma, that that funding, that level of funding that really helped, you know, buoy Texans and and get them the care that they needed um, would be spread far more thinly. And that may really impact people's ability to get care um, in, in this particular moment. May I add something to, to this part? Something we haven't mentioned is that it is not just about the funding or that's not the only part that determines if you can get an abortion. Something we have to consider is that many abortion facilities that used to provide services won't be able to provide anymore. So those that remain open will face an excess or are facing an excess demand for their services. So even if someone can reach the facility, maybe she won't be able to get the appointment whenever she wants it or even she may not be able to get an appointment at all. So we also have this constraint from the supply side of the market, from the the providers. There are not enough providers maybe to to take care of all this demand that could have gone to other clinics in the absence of Roe being overturned. And Myra, I'll stay with you. I mean, you mentioned the, the disparities and kind of wanting to get into more of that and what we're seeing uh, kind of across the board. Can you speak to that? And also just want to have a reminder, I don't know if everyone can see this, but you can submit your questions using the Q&A icon and we'll get to some of those in just about five minutes. Yes. So this is, I would say, like a very persistent finding in the literature and is that in terms of access to reproductive health care, not just access to abortion, there are different impacts across demographic groups. Something that has been very well documented is that specifically in terms of abortion access, both the impacts of expanding access when abortion became legal, but also the impacts of restrictions 
have been stronger among low income women and particularly a other demographic group, which are black women. So we know that, for example, when abortion became legal, the impacts in terms of uh, improvements in educational attainment and labor force participation were stronger for black women relative to white women. Similarly, we know that the impacts of some abortion restrictions are concentrated among black women. And among the potential explanation why this is the case is because this population in general has higher rates of unmet needs for contraception. They have higher rates of unintended pregnancy. They also report higher use of abortion services. In general, they are more likely to live in poverty, which even increases these barriers they, they face in order to access reproductive health care. And also, this combined with the fact that there is a, this a structural racism that has created some mistrust towards the healthcare system, even creates some, in some cases, a hesitation to look for healthcare when they need it. So a combination of all these factors makes some population groups, particularly black women, which are the ones that have been documented so far, more likely to be most affected by restrictions to access abortion. But since we are talking about Texas, and Texas has also a big population that is Hispanic, this is total, uh, I mean, I don't have a, the data yet to prove it, but I would say this is a population in which we could also expect some uh, this differences in impacts relative to other demographic groups. Yeah, and I'd just like to pick up on that and, and say that, you know, again, we we do not yet have um, the information to support this, but, you know, what we have heard through some of our um, conversations with colleagues is that, you know, people who are, who have concerns around crossing interior border checkpoints, um, those who are living in the lower Rio Grande Valley along the U.S.-Mexico border and El Paso, who are concerned about you know, whether or not they or their companions are going to be stopped and interrogated by customs and border officials are those who are going to be reluctant or hesitant to try to cross into another state in order to get care and may look to other means to try to end their pregnancies. Kind of um, looking ahead, if we can look ahead yet, because there's still so many unknowns right now in, in terms of uh, what could be next, not only the legal fight, but also the, the medical care and kind of what we're seeing. But um, Dr. Aiken, I'll, I'll let you weigh in. And, um, obviously, we're already hearing, and we've mentioned some of these, some of the, the fights that we could see even this next legislative session. And um, speaking to Texas specifically, but even kind of what we're seeing in, in other states, what do you think is potentially next when it comes, if it, you know, indeed continues to be a Republican-led state and, and the push that they've had for restricting access to abortion care, is there more that we should be looking at in terms of how people could be affected? Or do you think this is kind of the, the end? I think we're unfortunately quite far from the end. And I would say that uh, trigger bans certainly, as my colleagues have mentioned, uh, will be taking effect, are taking effect, and have taken effect in large swaths of the country. And so that, uh, in many ways, for those who would support and pass those policies, in some ways, takes care um, of a lot of the idea of accessing abortion in clinics. Um, I think that you mentioned something earlier, uh, Karina, that uh, is concerning. Uh, it may well not jive with federal law, but the idea of preventing people from traveling out uh, side of states, I think uh, federal interstate commerce laws are in direct opposition to that, but that doesn't mean that people may not try to pass bills on uh, and, and have subject those to legal challenge to see how far they can get with those. I think that another thing that I've been hearing about and reading about a lot um, from folks who are supportive of these kinds of laws is that uh, there's a big concern about self-managed abortion, about the idea that, you know, these trigger bans will, in, to some extent, take care of abortions in clinic settings, but what about what people are doing at home? And that is a difficult practice to regulate because, of course, the private nature of someone's self-managed abortion means it may not be something that's ever known about. Um, it's not something that's public knowledge. And I think uh, 
we enter some very difficult territory uh, when it comes to the idea of, you know, I, I, I would argue that a lot of these laws are already subjecting people to completely unacceptable oppression, but at the same time, uh, how far into people's private lives uh, are legislators willing to go? How much surveillance uh, can we expect? Uh, how much uh, crackdown, I guess I'll say, on the idea of medication abortion pills and how to do that, I think is something folks are actively thinking about. I also think that um, there has been talk of fetal personhood laws and the idea of going further than simply taking away the constitutional right to choose abortion, but go further than that and grant full legal personhood rights to fetuses, which comes with a, a huge set um, of uh, difficult legal um uh, jeopardies that have not yet been tested and that will affect people. I mean, I think these laws already do affect people farther than just abortion care. Uh, maternal mortality is something we haven't really talked about much yet, but that is something uh, that we need to keep in mind. You know, more unwanted pregnancies, more unwanted pregnancies for people who are in bad medical situations, who uh, cannot physically cope with pregnancies, who are uh, discriminated against, who face all kinds of uh, structural oppressions and racism, as uh, Dr. Pineda Torres called out. I think think we can expect to see increases in maternal morbidity and mortality. Uh, when you get into personhood, you start to look at IVF and fertility treatments. Um, it gets very, very complicated very quickly. So I don't know that I have a prognosis for what is coming down the policy pipeline, uh, but certainly there are a lot of things uh, swirling uh, and it remains to be seen how far those will go and uh, to what extent they will run into um, opposition from federal law or from the courts. Yeah, I think we could do a whole section on the maternal mortality, the IVF situation that people have been discussing so much right now, too. Um, I'm going to get to some of these questions. And um, speaking of, of the maternal mortality, um, Dr. White, I'll, I'll come to you first on this. But Catherine asks if we could speak to the potential impact of the Dobbs decision on maternal mortality and morbidity in Texas. And I'm just going to let you weigh in on that as well. Yeah, that's a, a really great question. And I think just um, a nice um, I guess if you can say that um, transition from what we were just talking about, I mean, Texas already has a very high rate of maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity that um, particularly affects um, women of color and, and Black women specifically for the, the reasons that we've already discussed. I think what we, um, we are likely to see the statistics around maternal mortality and morbidity worsen in the coming years if abortion remains illegal and if providers are afraid to offer um, standard medical care to people who are experiencing complications during their pregnancy, um, it is really going to push people into dangerous medical situations. If someone um, is forced to wait until they develop a life-threatening infection like sepsis or starts hemorrhaging before a provider can intervene, we have great medical technologies, but sometimes that isn't going to be enough in order to prevent someone from dying from those particular conditions. And so I think we are likely to see a worsening of our already abysmal maternal mortality and morbidity rates in Texas. And this is going to fall hardest on people of color. Mary, you may want to um, weigh in on that as well, but I'll also just pose this question. Another one is, will any of the federal interventions that President Biden is proposing be helpful or declaring abortion a public health emergency? I would say I don't want to comment on that because <laughs> I am not very well informed. Uh, more than not well informed, I don't know what we can expect about that. I could tell you from what we already know, I could tell you, I, I want to speak, uh, I would say like very upfront, I cannot answer that question because I am not very uh, informed. So if anyone can wait on that, I would prefer. But I would say that something that is concerning for me in the specific case of Texas is that unfortunately, we already know a lot about Texas. Why? Because so many previous policies were implemented before that inform us on the status of reproductive healthcare access in Texas which were the fundings on family planning policy, HB2. And unfortunately, the behavioral responses of people were not necessarily mitigating the impacts of the policy. With this, I mean, we didn't see changes in contraception use. We didn't changes in other uh, 
other situations that could compensate uh, the potential issues with these policies. So my point with this, I am not really trying to deviate from the conversation, is that we already know what, how Texas population respond to some of these policies. And even if one of, uh, assuming one of these state policies, uh, federal policies is implemented in Texas, I don't know how responsive the Texas population would be to that. I don't know if it would totally compensate the current impacts that banning abortion has in the state. So that's all I want to say. Um, Dr. Engen, you kind of spoke to, to this earlier, but I'll just, uh, another question is there, is there any information on how women access abortion who do not have the ability to order online? And I'm guessing yeah. something to do with the uh, medication abortion. And- yeah, for sure. And I think that, um, That is something that, yeah, we have some information on it. It's very difficult, for example, to count. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is how many people are self-managing and what proportion of them are going to an online service like Aid Access that's going to provide you with pills and instructions and a help desk where you can ask questions and all that kind of support uh, versus people who are doing things without any of that kind of support or information. And the answer is, of course, it's really tough to tell because of the private nature of these things. We can't count them all. We never will. We we kind of have to realize that. But there are other ways we know from qualitative research studies, talking to people, um, that people will oftentimes um, get pills uh, through various networks that they might know about. They may cross the border if they're able to do that um, to pharmacies in Mexico where you can get misoprostol. And you can do uh, medication abortion at home using misoprostol alone, even if you don't have mifepristone, which is the first uh, medication in the medication abortion sequence of mifepristone followed by misoprostol, but you can use misoprostol alone. Uh, And then there are people who will be using um, herbal methods, uh, other kinds of methods. These are methods we haven't got a whole lot of research on, but we do know that self-managed abortion, even though we think about it, and I think we talk about it a lot more now uh, that we're in this uh, new policy situation, it's been going on since there were people in North America, right? And people have successfully self-managed abortions throughout history. So even though we haven't got robust evidence on the effectiveness of things like herbal and botanical methods, it doesn't mean that people don't use them or can't use them. Um, And uh, that's something I think that we also need uh, to pay more attention to um, from a research perspective as well. So yeah, it's not a panacea, right? Not everybody will be able to self-manage. It's not going to be everyone's preference. Some people would absolutely prefer to be in the clinic setting. That's what they want, or they want what I would call a procedural. You may have heard it called surgical abortion. I say procedural because there's no surgery involved. Uh, they may prefer that. So having an abortion at home with pills is not acceptable for them, or they have someone in their house that they can't disclose this to, or they could suffer harm if someone uh, in their household found out about the abortion. So it's not, and of course, there's gestational age, right? We know that with advancing gestational age, uh, doing an abortion with pills at home is less likely to work and could subject someone to a higher risk of complications. So uh, while self-managed abortion is becoming uh, a lot more of the story, I think, for abortion access, certainly we need to be careful about talking about it as uh, the solution or the sort of um, silver bullet here. Um, I know that we've spoken to this too a little bit, but um, speaking to doctors and the providing medical care and, and Dr. White, if you want to weigh in on this, um, Michelle writes, women are suffering and will die where the consequences really carefully considered before Roe was ended or SB8 passed in Texas. Well, I, I think people who crafted these bills, you know, will say that there are exemptions for medical emergencies um, to save the pregnant person's life, um, that care can still be provided in cases of miscarriage or ectopic pregnancy. But I think what we have seen how these policies play out in practice is that the potential of civil civil and now criminal liability for someone who is seen as violating these laws um, is really having a chilling effect, as Dr. Aiken said, and providers are afraid to intervene. They are afraid to provide the standard of care. And there becomes this question, uh, a very tricky question of, you know, how at risk of death does someone need to be? Um, Is is 50% a a good time to intervene or does it really need to be like 95% before a provider can come and offer care? for someone to try to save their life. 
So I think, you know, again, in many other instances of medical care, providers are trying to intervene to prevent more serious harm from taking place. Um, but we are in a situation with these types of very narrow, narrow exemptions and the chilling effect from legal penalties um, that providers are just afraid to intervene until people become very, very sick. Um, Dr. Pineda Torres, here's an, um, actually somebody just put another one. Um, the, the topic of maternal mortality, and I think you can speak to this, um, while they're talking about Texas and the state health department having a maternal mortality task force, um, and saying that maternal mortality has been a priority. So what happens now if that goes up? We've been speaking to that a little bit, but how do you see that affecting all of this in, in terms of the disparities that you've been talking to, the economics that you've been talking to, and what happens now if we see that really jump even more than it already is? So I, I was not familiar with the Maternal Mortality Task Force. I actually don't know how they operate, like what are their strategies? But if maternal mortality, the point of this task force is to improve uh, maternal mortality, reduce it, and it is a priority, it is like what they want to do. As Dr. Aiken said, like maternal mortality, we don't have the data yet, but we can expect a change there. If people are unable to interrupt a pregnancy when they need it, and if we end up in situation in which the healthcare providers cannot intervene, definitely it's expected that there would be those changes in terms of maternal mortality. If maternal mortality goes up, then if this is a priority, then the maternal mortality task force has to come up with ideas or ways of dealing with this issue. If abortion access is out of question, like people cannot get access to abortion, then maybe, I mean, I, this is just total ideas, but maybe there should be ways in which uh, healthcare providers could intervene to deal with this situation that has not to do, nothing to do with abortion access. I really don't know, but I think like if the priority is dealing with maternal mortality, then there should be another way to compensate this losing access to abortion services. That's all I could say. I don't know if Dr. White can elaborate given her knowledge on what else can be done in that sense. I'll just make one brief comment. And that is that, you know, I think one thing that we haven't really talked about here that is, is very policy relevant is the insurance safety net that um, is available and the gaps that are in that safety net. Um, Texas is one of, of um, just a handful of states now that has not expanded Medicaid. Um, the extension for postpartum Medicaid um, was only authorized for six months following delivery, but we know from um, an analysis of when maternal deaths occur that they can occur up to 12 months following the end of a pregnancy. Um, and so there are clear gaps um, in the um, benefits or, or opportunities for people to be able to get health care to help them have healthy pregnancies, to help them manage chronic conditions that can put their health or the health of a future pregnancy at risk. And those are not um, policy levers that the state of Texas has um, currently chosen to use. I'll um, end with this. I think we're about out of time, but um, Dr. Aiken, I'll, I'll send this to you. Some of these are kind of, what is your opinion? And you don't have to say that, but... <laughs> um, it's another issue that we haven't really talked about, but that has been brought up. Um, what do you think? And maybe more so just kind of how feasible do you think it is? Uh, the idea of making abortion legal and establishing facilities on federal land. Yeah, that's such an interesting one. And there has been, um, you know, a lot of uh, sort of public talking about that recently. And I believe just to clarify that I'm not a qualified lawyer, but I do believe there are some uh, legal risks uh, to that because although you're correct in that, you know, federal uh, land uh, is there and it spans many states, um, I think there are some legal uh, question marks around when uh, federal land could be considered an entirely federal enclave versus um, a area of land that has joint federal and state 
state control, a little bit like the Medicaid program, where there's a little bit of dollars coming from here and a little bit coming from there, uh, to make an analogy. And so I think states would still have potential uh, legal recourse um, over the idea that all federal, so-called federal lands are entirely federally controlled. I think there's also an historical issue around the laws applying to that federal land at the time the states uh, gave that land over or the time it became under federal control or became under state control. So you may find some legal difficulties in terms of what abortion laws look like back at that point in history. Uh, and those might apply. Um, but I see the rationale for the idea, right, that if the federal government can say, hey, we're OK with abortion on lands that belong to us and we'll start putting these clinics in place. It still might not get us over, even if it is legally feasible and unchallenged or it's success unsuccessfully challenged in courts of getting people to those places. Right. And in terms of travel, in terms of costs, in terms of how it will work out, because I don't think it would negate the Hyde Amendment, the idea that you can't use uh, federal funds to help pay for abortions for people. Uh, but I've also heard recently, too, about the idea of a boat in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and that's something, you know, that was done by international activist groups in Ireland way back in the day in 1999. A boat came and started providing abortions of pills off the coast of Ireland in waters, international waters, where the jurisdiction of the boat and not the uh, country would apply. So there are all kinds of, I think, creative things that people are thinking of. Um, I would say that we are in such a legally uh, swirling time right now that, you know, because so many of these things will be challenged at different levels of the legal system, um, it is so unclear, I think, even to the experts, um, how all of this is going to turn out. And may, may I add something to that? I, I feel like there is, in that statement, I mean, it sounds like a good idea, but we're losing track of the other side of the market, which are the providers. Are providers going to be able to, let's assume like the situation comes into a way in which they, the abortion facilities can be there. Are abortion providers going to come there to work and provide their services there? Because they also have like their own life going on. They also have things going on. So making, it's not like they are movable and they can go anywhere. And something very important that Dr. Aiken mentioned is this also involves traveling. We go back to the same issue as before in which people have to go there. So there are all these costs associated from, with getting an abortion that will remain there. So this is not a solution that will compensate. It's, I feel it's like a patch on a bigger issue that requires more thinking to, to, to the actual root of the problem, which is people are losing access to a reproductive health care service. Clearly, we've only scratched the surface <laughs> and we could do probably 20 more of these and get into all of these other topics, but we are out of time. And I just want to thank all of our panelists for all of, uh, they've been that they've contributed to this and for um, helping us kind of understand all of this and and uh, what is happening moving forward. Dr. Aiken, Dr. Pineda Torres, and Dr. White, thank you so much for your time. And I will hand it back to Victoria. Thank you all. And thank you to our panel and moderator for sharing your time and expertise with us today. And thank you again to today's audience for engaging with us. The Future Forums events are made possible by our incredible partners and sponsors, including the Downtown Austin Alliance. If you are not yet a member of the Future Forum, I encourage you to sign up on our website, lbjfutureforum.org. Members enjoy first access to events and happy hours, networking opportunities, and benefits at the LBJ Library. Thanks so much again, and I hope to see you all again soon.